everybody, we're going to get the show on the road. Uh, my name is Javier Heinz. I'm the communication manager here at the Center for Sport Excellence in Teaching. Welcome. I am very happy to introduce uh, Xavier Monroe. Uh, he is one of the very first people I met here at the very oh, first party that I ever went to for <laughs> season. <laughs> Hey, we have almost the exact same name. Let's get to know each other. True so, story. That was nearly five years ago. Five years ago, uh, you started his doctoral work here uh, at the San Diego Medical School of Education. And so it's very much my pleasure to introduce him and to hear what he has to say. Welcome to David. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't have to read people would show up on <laughs> Wednesday in the cold. <laughs> um, but thank you for, for coming. Uh, and today we're going to have hopefully a little bit of a conversation uh, about this idea that I'm working on of policy actualizers and policy actualizers not being the like, thing in our school districts. And, and so today we're going to talk about uh, an, an exam. We're going to examine a district STEAM reform, STEM with arts, that a superintendent in a, in a North Florida school district put together to try to bring about equity in the school districts. We know what happens um, when we put on our teacher hats, we come in and try to change things too quickly. Um, we don't necessarily get the results we want, but it's still worth the try. And I think if we focus on this idea of policy, we might end up on the about some changes that we would like to see in schools. So I go back to the 18th, 17th century to get some insights. Uh, and Wolfgang von Goethe made this, this very salient point. Thinking is easy, action is difficult, and to put one's thoughts into action is the most difficult thing in the world. I believe in speaking and educating said this line, <laughs> thoughts represents policy, we always have policy coming our way, action represents reform, we don't necessarily see policy actualized to reform. However, let's bring it uh, closer to the modern day, the people that we know can change the world and always does so for better hope. Yes. <laughs> Oprah created this leadership academy in South Africa, she wanted to bring about opportunities for South African girls in particular. So she created this leadership academy. And what was interesting is that we, Oprah has this limitless amount of money and connections and opportunities, and there were growing pains in this academy. And one of the things that was important was she recognized the, the importance of being able to speak with people and empower people in the process. And once they got the I think those 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 key points. The Leadership Academy has done some pretty positive things in the lives of these girls in South Africa, including coming to some of the best universities in the United States. Jeffrey Canada, I think, is another example of taking, building, and empowering individuals to the next level. He created this organizational structure, the system, all of the children's on the wall, work with community organizations, the local government, educators, and he put together uh, this this educational opportunity spectrum that many come to praise. Harvard loves to bring Jeffrey Canada in and talk about this all of the children's zone. We created the infrastructure, we empowered individuals, we saw some changes in action. So let's come back a little, a little closer to the current day. I don't know about you, but I was extremely <laughs> surprised at what happened in states like West Virginia. Arizona and Oklahoma, mm -hmm. and in West Virginia this week, mm -hmm. and then across the Bay. Yeah. And so, just for a quick moment, I want you to put on your educators and teachers hat. Think about opportunities that they do, were able to change policy. And maybe it was in your classroom, maybe it was the school level, you can find policy. So, just for a minute or so, talk to a neighbor and think about a way that you felt that you could change policy in your classroom or your school. Sure. <laughs> 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 
Conversations and sometimes they can be characters, but there are other times that I think we are overlooking some of the powerful influences that individuals that schools can have in shaping policy big and large. I'm just curious, what are some of the examples that you all discuss? No, it's just it was interesting because when you know I asked. A friend here about you know those kind of that question. She's like, I didn't, I didn't actually ever see it as policy. I just saw it as this is what I'm, you know, I'm here to do. I'm here to teach kids, right? And so she never framed it that way when she was thinking about it in her class. So I thought that was an interesting point to think, especially from a teacher perspective. Point to the policy to the reform, policy. right? Yeah, I agree. We didn't see the connect. Yeah. Yeah. I'm changing this. Um, I don't know what they say. We're doing this, but still, like not even, yeah. not even seeing that there was supposed to be a connection, right. but this is like the total like work. No, we're not teaching that. Mm -hmm. We're not even like no. It's in my classroom. I follow in the letter of the law. <laughs> There's the book. Doesn't mean I have to use yeah. it. <laughs> 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 it's in the book. Yeah. <laughs> it's on the desk. It's so true. Uh, mm -hmm. Other groups. I, I just I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I shared that when I was a teacher, they tried to shut down our school. There was a plan to consolidate schools, and we did a number of things as a staff to basically stop them from shutting us down. And they voted to change their plan policy you know, of closing the schools. And it felt very empowering, actually, as a teacher, mm -hmm. to feel like you made a result and that we were very strategic in working off the board members. And <laughs> Yeah, that, that's it. But that sounds like it took a very big group effort. It was our school, though. I mean, it was our teachers that really did it, and we, we worked with the teacher. We work with the parents, and um, very... but then we also started a new program at our school strategically. We started with the National Guard of Oakland as an elementary mm -hmm. school, and they saw that program and they were like, "We don't want to get rid of this program." Instead of we don't want to just shut down your school because they were just equating our school to like how much money they would save until so they saw our school as something different than just money or resources. Like so, adding more value. That's right. Yeah. There was also talk about how you were over here too. Emily. 
I taught in an IB school, and what I saw a lot of people doing was taking the IB, which could be considered probably even almost curriculum in, in, in some circles, and just try to, you know, morph it a little bit to make it really coherent with what was already happening, borrowing a few pieces, reshaping a few pieces, but um, being very selective in what in, in the ways that it, it actually influenced. So, so a little bit of this. And I love equitable classrooms. I cannot get enough of school. There's a nice conversation going on. No, we were just really talking a, a little bit about how you know there's a policy around equity, um, and there's the talk around it, um, and then just the kind of like call it for what it is, call it out and listen to what the response is and then push back. Because sometimes it takes a lot of people um, by surprise. I think the other thing is that um, it looks to a rethinking of who's in the room and who's at the table. Because you know, if certain mm -hmm. people aren't at the table, for some that's, I don't have to really think about it. And so mm -hmm. um, that was kind of like one of those in the moment kinds of, yeah, and we're gonna think about this. That's a good point. Let's see what's, what's, what's left in the presentation. <laughs> but I think you, you all raised some important points. And, and I would argue, advisor, that what we saw going on in many states and others were teachers taking on the role of policy makers and performers. Not only were they talking about salary in some ways, but they were talking about textbooks, being able to afford new and appropriate textbooks. They were talking about school infrastructure. They were talking about classroom size, bringing guidance counselors and art teachers. They were bringing policy to the legislatures that ended up in reform. And even in a state like West Virginia, they would not take no or a backwards no for an answer. They showed them this week that we need business. So I think we should we should rethink what we how we label policy makers or policy actualizers and the roles that they serve in schools and school districts. So, so the roadmap for the day, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about policy and equity. We'll go into some theoretical discussions of what, how I've been thinking about this. Talk about the study, um, a, another conversation of what, what policy and school districts and equity uh, might mean and the results that we'd like to see. And then we'll, we'll jump right into the results. Uh, and there's even some Tebos in here too. <laughs> So I argue that we keep having the same conversations. Equity has emerged uh, in, in education for quite some time. We can go back to the 50s when we're talking about the race to space. In the 80s, we had some initial conversations in math that just in the 90s, uh, how we can bring about equity in, 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 our, in learning and teaching. Science seems to come along in the late 90s, 2000s in this, this conversation. And so we, we keep talking about equity and the need to examine. And I'm just curious of why we're having these conversations over and over again and having the same results. So this is it's part of the emphasis of this research. How can we stop having these conversations and actually engage in the reform work that needs to occur? Uh, and one way uh, that I just touched upon is STEAM. STEAM opportunities, STEAM with arts, uh, because they continue to fall short. They have these wonderful conversations. You know, we are going to do equity and diversity and inclusion. NGSS has these words, they have nice pictures in the textbook and the books, um, but we, we still have these large gaps in, in, in learning. And, and again, as I mentioned earlier, I think it's important to have these conversations to point out where, where the deficits are. Uh, science education is a good example of, of having these conversations that's lacking behind math, uh, and yet we seem to keep putting it in the forefront. And we, we have STEM and STEAM just buzzwords to have uh, these, these uh, conversations that I think it's getting a little bit old that we're rebelling children. So, theoretical focus. So, when we have these conversations, there are what I think are like four buckets. We talk about the socioeconomics of it. 
achievement gap is one of them, the opportunity gap is one of them. We said that these come about in terms of segregation and income, and that, that, that's true. But I think we can we can push a little bit forward, and I think that this is this important work. Then another bucket I think in, in policy and reform is talking about teacher quality. We need to train more teachers. We need to have more resources. We look at why they're leaving schools, why they're staying in schools. Again, I think this is, this is important, but I don't think it gives us quite uh, the, the pathway, the framework that we need. The organizational concerns. Again, this is important. Uh, a lot of this comes from sociology. Uh, we're talking about how systems shape or hinder or promote certain changes, um, particularly in equity-minded reforms. Uh, again, I think it's a piece of the puzzle, not necessarily all of it. Uh, and then there's what I call uh, the history of education and the sociology of education. This is uh, Larry Cuban and David Tayek and Cynthia Coburn. And we were examining uh, how individuals within systems or working with other individuals can, can shape and bring about the change, some types of changes. They've done studies of curriculum. And, and so, again, another bucket, but I think that we, we need to go a little bit further. I think we need to start examining policy and action. Most of these discussions are always post mortem. We're looking at something that happened, we're trying to diagnose it, and then we forget about the change we want to see. So policy and action, I think we, we can draw from those buckets, start focusing on examining the changes that we want to see, how are they working, uh, and perhaps do some course corrections, and, and then perhaps we might see some of the activities that you want to do like, and particularly in regards to STEM, STEAM equity. And I believe Common Core, uh, what's left of Common Core and GSS are important conversations that we can base this, these ideas around. So the way I look at this is through this idea of sense making. And sense making provides an opportunity for us to look at macro levels, so we can look at structures and, and how they are shaping change or shaping the ideas that we would like to see. And then it also gives us an opportunity to go to the micro level, individuals, how are individuals, how are actors within these systems uh, working together, interacting, understanding what's going on to bring about change. And so we have this, this connection between macro shaping, macro, oh, excuse me, micro, so institutional context, shaping how individuals are understanding these ideas and how that understanding is in turn shaping or reshaping the institution. So I think sense making, I believe sense making is, uh, particularly by Carl White, is, is an appropriate way that we can engage in this conversation. And what's interesting is that it brings both the psychological and the sociological perspective in trying to understand how we can bring about change, particularly within the context of school. And there, there are two ways that we can look at sense making. It's a two institution shaping the sense making, so that, that macro structure shaping the micro structure, uh, and sense making shaping institutions. Uh, and, and here are some of the outcomes that we might see in, in that process. Um, now just give me a second to, to glance at these. And one of the things that's important is to understand that this is an ongoing process, and it's a collective process. Mm -hmm. that, that this is, that's why we started with the conversation with teachers engagement and the changes that we saw in those three states and across the nation. Uh, it's continual, it has to be continual, it has to be collective, it has to be an interaction with the systems and the individuals within the body. David, could you explain the second floor of the sense making institution, and the first floor under sense making shapes institutions? So uh, this, this is talking about the role of individuals in the process, continually engaging in acts or actions and thought processes. Okay. So where it's these institutions being it as individuals? Well, I think what this, what this point is trying to make is that individuals are the ones that uh, are shaping the institution. So if the institution has changed, so the new might be just a different form. It might be a changed institution, like the school she was talking about. Yes. That would be a new institution, even though it's the same school. Mm -hmm. It's now a different school. It's a good example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. exactly. And that's was changed because of something. Yes. Okay. 
So since making this idea goes back, uh, I would argue to the, the late 1900s, you have William James that, that proposes this idea that we should keep understanding issues and, and how they are being painted in ways that bring about change. And, and I think Margaret Mead and, and her ethnography or work uh, is quite important when she's talking about social processes, uh, shaping uh, collective understanding, uh, even before we get to individualized notions of understanding. Uh, Bernard, I think, brings a, a key uh, uh, vocabulary when he talks about organizations as complex systems that we need to look at actors, we need to look at patients, we need to look at the infrastructure that exists. And so we have this idea of being organizations being things that can be changed and difficult to change. Uh, Baber, I think, brings in this idea of social action so that we need to examine what it means for individuals to engage in thought processes and continue with changes uh, to bring about uh, the type of reform or opportunities for improvement. Uh, March and Olson in 76 uh, points us to the direction of understanding how individuals are continually interpreting and understanding ideas and how that engages uh, in sense making. Uh, in 1982, uh, we have Wick you know, proposing this idea, initial idea of, of sense making in its earlier forms. And one of the things that's important in the work that I do is to look at the contribution of minorities uh, in women and women's conversations. And I think uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, I believe W.E.B. Du Bois, this idea of double consciousness, the, the mm -hmm. ideas that individuals, particularly minorities, uh, how they have to be systems to bring about change or benefit from systems is important in how we can engage in, in reform-minded actions. Uh, I think that is something that we can apply to teachers. You know, they have that uh, dichotomy of being told what to do, but then you know, knowing that the better option is alternatives are better for their students. And I think that we should also pay attention to individuals like James Anderson, uh, Vanessa Sutton Walker, when they're talking about minority communities building infrastructure to educate individuals often pushed out of systems of schooling and education and how these are examples of reform policy we need to reform call to action and how we can bring about meaningful change in the world. So the research context. I had the opportunity to go to this diverse school district in North Florida that really represents what we as a nation are going to. We are diversifying as a nation. We are educating students from different uh, backgrounds uh, and different opportunity levels. And so I had the opportunity to go into the school district that was really engaged in bringing about equitable learning opportunities to the students. The superintendent came, he's the first African American superintendent appointed to this district. He says, I see a tale of two school districts and I don't like which one. We need to do something. About this, and push the community into this important conversation about equity and change and the tough conversations that we need to have. And, and I believe we, we, this was the context that we could actually learn something from and, and multiply, uh, replicate across the country. Why? Well, this school district has one of the worst achievement and opportunity gaps in the state of Florida mm -hmm. and <coughs> nation. It appears on the, the Reardon map of achievement gap in the nation that stands out. It should not happen in a community with several higher uh, institutions of higher learning uh, that has the capacity, the resource, and very sensitive communities to reduce this disparity. And the superintendent is engaging in these conversations with those entities as well. And this gap, I might add, uh, did not do for white students. They were suffering within the system, not as bad, of course, as with the this achievement gap. And what another interesting point to show is that the achievement gap is actually better. It was less for ELL students. ELL students were performing better than these African American students that spoke English as a first language. There were some serious issues going on within this district, and the superintendent came to try to change.
And so I came in with a couple, a few, a few questions. I wanted to understand how this policy was implemented at different schools. Uh, he rolled out this initiative for phases. The first phase was intended for schools with the worst achievement gap in the county. The second phase, uh, would, would everyone would be able to participate in this opportunity, but he wanted, he said, this example was, if you're in the ER, you do not triage the patient with a cut on the finger. You, tr you triage the patient that's about to lose their life. And so that was the example he went into. And so I wanted to understand how policy flowed from the district uh, level to the teachers. And I want to understand where exactly was the influence, who were the policy actualizers that would bring about this change. So what did I do? So I wanted to see how teachers and, and individuals directly tied to them, Trump teachers, uh, understood or made sense of this, this new district steam policy. So I tried to get a diversity of thought. I incorporated four schools in the study. They vary based on their socioeconomic status uh, and racial diversity makeup. I interviewed teachers that vary in the subjects that they taught. So some might have taught primary grades, some on mediated, intermediate grades, some may have focused primarily on math or science, and others may have focused on arts. I really want to get a diversity of thought on how this STEAM policy was supposed to shape the practices in their, their classroom. And then I also spoke with the two curriculum specialists, the district and the district, who were tasked with implementing, making, and implementing this policy. This is interesting because these are not district administrators. These were not individuals that were pushing back on my job. These were really teachers with special assignments that were given this, this opportunity to shape and implement policy. And I think we'll, we'll see how that relationship led to some meaningful changes in, in, in this, this initiative. Uh, the, the tasks were interviews and a think aloud uh, activity. I wanted to see how they talked to engage with the policy itself. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was the think aloud task. And of course, some, some meetings about what was going on in the district, developing uh, policy understanding to support uh, understanding and implementation, and the resources that were provided. I really wanted to get diversity of the thought of what was going on. Uh, analysis, consistent experimental theory. I wanted to let the, the results come from what said, I wanted to try to make sense of that, and then I got a little more focus on the analysis after that. So again, let's just copy the task. These six slides, the, which were posted to the out task, were the superintendents report to the community. We had a 100-day report. We told the community, this is what we're going to do based on data and conversations that I've collected. Uh, he then went to 100. He had 100 visits, walking communities with his wife. Communities, going to schools, going to businesses in the community. He wanted to understand what was going on and what could be done to address this issue. And this was those were six slides taken from this report to the community. So if you released it to the community, I wanted to see if individuals in these classrooms had saw this and understood what was going on because they were the ones that were expected to implement these ideas. And and so the coding, there were four four domains of coding, there were several layers in that, in, in that scheme. Today we're really just going to focus on uh, the policy understanding and participation and learning aspect in, in this, this process, particularly how individuals perceive their role in the policy the implementation processes and the opportunities that they had to engage and learn and understand the, the policy itself. So what happened? I'll give you a minute to, to take a look at this first quote. And I, I bolded what I thought would be so in points in this concept. What I find interesting in this, this quote uh, is that there's a, a key relationship between making sure that what's going on at the district, understanding what's going on, what's envisioned at the district, is what's going on in the classrooms. To see what is that relationship. Again, this is a teacher on special assignment, so perhaps she had some insights that, that both pushed her into that direction. But it was important to her uh, to make sure that there was a relationship between the district and the schools, and a continual relationship between the districts and schools to help actualize this, this, this policy. 
Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. So there are several aspects. There, this the STEM component of the policy is one for for farms. So there was a early childhood initiative uh, in the county. There was a around the aging and employment, and the process is a focus on literacy in, in the process. And then there was increased STEM uh, STEM opportunity, and what that meant was providing enhanced opportunities in the region STEM learning. So that's essentially we provide. STEM. Curriculum materials or after school during school. Okay. So during school. Some schools had already participated in after school opportunities, but the teacher had to raise funds. There was actually an upheaval. The parents were there, the kids on the other side of town were getting this during the day, and we already have, and we have to continue to fundraise this program. So that, that, that's one example. As far as an example for arts, you repurpose uh, one particular school into a fine arts program. So that they have had instrumental and forward. They had um, the arts piece wasn't necessarily connected to STEM. Well, in this in this particular school, it was the teachers oh. were planning. So what they were doing in in music, particularly in their instrument classes, was engaged to what they were trying to discuss that they were having in math. So team planning. So then we'll get to it with both some of those teachers there. So when we talk about the STEAM policy, that's exactly what we're going on. We really thought about it from a holistic perspective. Great. That gives me more context for my team. Of course. Of course. The second quote, uh, what was an interesting, interesting to me too, this was the principal who made it quite clear, hey, at the end of the year, I am judged on how my students perform in these assessments. I, I, whatever I need to do to make sure that they're doing well on those assessments is important, but I believe in this, this work too. But I think we have to do more than just worry about the test. Uh, but one of the things that she pushed for was we need to be in this mix of what's going on. Um, if we want to be holistic in the education that we're providing our students, I am the leader, I am the manager who has to make this work at my school and it work. And, and so I need to be, we need to be in those conversations and, and particularly at the district level so that when we're implementing it at our schools, we're doing it well and we're doing it with fidelity and we're doing it in ways that we will have lasting. So I think what we see here is that we need to have a, a role for middle managers, principals, uh, those in curriculum departments to have that continued connection between what's going on at schools, what's going on at the district level, if we want to see continuous change. Can I ask one question? When they said they're being judged, are they being judged by a science assessment? Yes. Or, and when does that happen? Fifth grade. Fifth grade, okay. And, and this initiative uh, was rolled out in fifth grade in particular. Okay. So this was some, this was aimed at trying to in, reduce that, that equity gap, uh, or inequity gap, particularly in fifth grade. So we, we saw that the robotics uh, initiative reached out there to keep students engaged and interested. As long, and tying it to what they were supposed to be doing with the, the pacing guides in the history, as well as the, uh, the, the math and guide from the state standards mm -hmm. that they were talking to. So there was, supposed, there was supposed to be coherence between all of these things. There's a lot of work that needs to go on this summer before this policy was not going to happen, uh, and the reform efforts that are supposed to occur during this year. Moving Lego Robotics with the scratch programming language, that doesn't look like Lego Robotics. Um, this was fixed. Okay, fixed. Yes. And and what's interesting, they had conversations on which which program to use, and so they chose fixed because they thought it was a bit more comprehensive. They thought it was a bit more challenging. They thought it was it would take the convinced business community to provide some of the resources uh, to implement this and solution. This is quite an expensive particular change. So I'll give you a moment. To, to digest this one. What was, what was interesting when I got, I didn't know about this program when I got to interviewing with the teachers. A part of this, this initiative the, was creating this teacher leader program. The superintendent wanted teachers to become, to bring their expertise from the schools to classrooms to the district. And so we created this teacher program. 
now it varied on who got access to that particular position. We'll get to that in a little bit. But there were teachers finally got a voice in some of the curricular decision making in, in the district. But even then, um, let's see what Even then, what we see is that there is a direct tie to the standards. And what's interesting about this quote is we see math, science, we see everything that is tested. So what they were talking about, tests, uh, quarterly assessments, summative assessment at the, the end of the year. So they were saying they had impact on shape on assessments and they were being judged by. Not necessarily uh, changing the curricular structure, uh, the reform process to get the equity that many had envisioned. But it was important that they had this opportunity to at least give some type of input in the decision making process. So teachers as leaders was quite important to some of these individuals. So what what uh, I think we uh, maybe we can focus back to is I think that we need to find ways to incorporate meaningfully incorporate teachers as leaders in the decision-making process, in the curricular decision-making process, in the policy-making process with their districts. And we should do the same thing when it comes to these designated and assessment modal managers. Give me a second to Again, we see an example we're focusing on tests. So I'm curious when I'm thinking having these conversations with these teachers, I'm thinking how willing is the district in providing the, the, the flexibility for them to be more leaders. But I, I would not underplace that. What we see is that teachers do feel that they have the capacity, the power to be leaders in, in this conversation. Does the district use this bulletin teacher evaluation? Yes, 40%. Wow. This and is a big deal. Yeah. No wonder the teachers are so tied into the, what the tests are doing. So, yes, uh, BAM scores is one for those that uh, have those skills. Uh, for others, it's district assessments. So, if you don't have to be considered tested in third grade, you can have district assessments. So, to them, this is important. That they have a teacher leader role because they are shaping the assessments that they're doing. They're making up the district. Judge. The teacher leaders work together to compile a district assessment. Yes, they have input in that for the first time. So now they feel as if they can shape what they can teach and how they can assess the teachers. So being a teacher leader is important. However, we're mis kind of missing the equity part of that the decision that they make. It's, it's But then we, we have some teachers that thought, well, this is uh, I like that we have this um, this this role in the policy practice, some policy practice relationship. But I feel like some of us aren't engaged enough in the conversation. Uh, it seems like those that have this opportunity are the only ones that we want to listen to. So while we have like this this policy structure, this this decision making structure that's changing, everyone that a lot of folks don't feel engaged in that process or have value that process. So I'm curious then is this is this a perception of like not being able to have a, their voice be at the table, or did they see like a lot of you know white teachers who are becoming the teacher leaders that are in the memos? So what what was it was a perception or was it like it's, it's, it's selective. interesting. It's interesting. It's, yeah, it's selective people, which people right, which it's interesting. People, right? And uh, and I'll just I'll let you come in with the decision. I'll just say so. This is uh, a number of the, the teacher leaders were women, and they were minority women mm -hmm. that were in, in getting these opportunities. Some of these quotes um, of pushback were coming from particularly male teachers and mm -hmm. Caucasian male teachers. Mm -hmm. um, I see. <laughs> so I, that was not a focus of this research, but I am saying, you know, if you want to engage in equity conversation, 
conversation we have here. Yeah, and so, and I will right. say uh, that this particular individual uh, took it upon himself to engage and provide opportunities to the students, uh, raising money to go fund me to like that was all my money, so that the students could get into this process. The second grade, the initiative goes on to get the fourth, so the school supposed to get this initiative for a couple of years. Uh, so, um, but he still left out, he felt left out of the process, but he, he did try to engage and try to get the opportunities to do this. So, with that said, I, I suggest that we still try to find inclusive and transparent ways. If you tell people what the process is to become a teacher, perhaps some of this resentment might, might go away. Uh, but we still need to be inclusive. Um, and in this district, they needed more women and minorities in the decision-making processes. Again, this is the, the first African-American superintendent appointed to this district. Um, it's as in a very diverse district at that state. So perhaps we can just be more transparent in how we provide opportunities, but we still need to be more inclusive in everything that we do. We're going to talk about equity uh, and equality. So another thing that, that emerged was that there's a lot of data that individuals kept talking about data. I was so worried. Uh, are, are we engaging in this because it's the right thing to do, or do we are we worried about our evaluation that we may get and the money that we might get to be tied to that evaluation? Mm -hmm. But I, I, we still um, data driven decision making is important, and we should engage in those conversations as well. But in this particular example, it was the arts, it was the magnet curriculum specialist that he was more focused on. Well, if it's working. Data says that it's working, and I, then I might go talk to teachers, and if they say that it's working, and if the students are really buying in, and by students really buying in, I got the, the hint that he was talking about our students achieving on the academic test, the markers, then, then we can say, well, that will drive implementation. There's a difference between what we saw with the STEM curriculum specialists, and she's talking about a pipeline in the district, and in classrooms to data-driven, being focused on data here. But again, it's important to talk to consider that relationship as well. What was interesting about this teacher uh, was that she was a union teacher, and she may have known her union. And but one of the things that got me in her quote, she said, "We we can give her the freedom to try these things out." There was the superintendent made it known that we need to put the power in the hands of the teachers to do what they do best. He trusted and had a heavy reliance on what teachers could do. He also made sure that there was a new professional development department created with the resources and capacity to build that. And he also made sure that teachers were in the schools and principals were engaged in, in, in professional development, continuous professional development too. Uh, but again, we go back to this needs uh, of testing. I was so surprised at the importance of testing in this conversation. But what I still got throughout despite that was that individuals were willing to engage and, and, and excited to engage in this, this, this process. They were doing uh, components of what the, the equity plan and the vision entails. And this, this goes back uh, to I think when Janet raised the, the teachers really were, they were using uh, common planning time. There was common planning time between the grade levels, between the, the fine arts individuals, between the, the STEM coach at, at the institution and each individual school. They were trying to find ways to make this work and make sure that they were still meeting the, the demands of their uh, evaluations, i.e. students passing and achieving and becoming some assessment in the real course of assessment. <coughs> Uh, and, and so there really was an all hands on deck approach to this. We saw really good change in this mission. However, and this is one, and I, I know we're not supposed to like choose favorites in our data. <laughs> but, 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 but <laughs> this individual, uh, really, I think she took the, the cake and, and she made it. She gave what I thought was a good summary argument. The, the policy was here before I got here. I don't know how much individuals had in that 
process, I, I know individuals that have much in that process, um, but we're still responsible for her and I have to do my job. I think this is important. Um, and she used this word as an implement for me. She's taken it upon herself as the fine arts coordinator to, to find ways she's pushing at the school to make sure that there's that common frame of mind. She's making sure that she's talking to Leo Bob and his coach and integrating that what they're doing in the classroom as I as how you plan to do that. And in the core we have to lead even in how do we lead it. So they're integrating that to the science. Uh, but this was really a, a, an addition initiative that worked. In this particular school, school grade, which had been a D or an F for the past five years, so this, this is really So there were components that meant this, this could work. But she, she was very um, honest and forthright in her interviews throughout this process. We weren't included in the earlier process. It's nice that they're trying to include us in this process. I'm the coordinator, so I have a title that means I should be in this process. Um, However, more work is, has to be done, but I take my role as implementer uh, quite seriously, and I'm going to make sure that this makes it and allows us to go on work. So again, um, more implementers are important in the process, particularly the policy making process. And, and I think that's a good segue to a finding that I got from the data. And each of these points, the majority of individuals, including two points of these, uh, I might have said that they had no role in this policy uh, process. They had no role in the thoughts, they had no role in the actions, they just needed to do their jobs. So not even implementation? Yes. Huh? That, that's what the majority <laughs> of these, and, 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 and well, actually, let's be honest, we have one principal that didn't say anything, so that's three out of four principals <laughs> <laughs> that, that does not see themselves in the policy. But I beg to differ because in those interviews we saw them saying, I had to change my, my schedule mm -hmm. so that we could implement this. And we found mm -hmm. that to do that. I had to rededicate classroom spaces and making sure that we were tying our curriculum resources that we had to make it more after school, the curriculum resources that we had. I had to go get the necessary capacity for myself if I'm not providing it. I don't know what robotics is. I don't know how I'm going to tie this into my science uh, curriculum. But they were doing those things. They were being the implementers. They were being policymakers at the school level if they did not have that connection from the district to the school level. So, so this is the perception of what role they had in yes. creating the policy, not what role they had in having to act. Actually, both. <laughs> yeah, their perception. Yeah. Uh, their perception, I, I, I agree. Well, and you're I, saying your perception is that you need to back. Yeah, my perception, yeah. Now, my <laughs> perception is if you, if you are changing capacity to the schools, you are engaging in this process. This was their perception, my perception from what I saw in the classroom, which was much more than what they were saying. Um, and so I think it, it, it gives us insight into how we should reframe what policy implementation looks like. If you look at implementers, what is actually what should look like? I think individuals are underselling. Themselves. This is what this side is supposed to tell us. Their perception is not, I, which I, I, their perception is not necessarily the reality that we saw in this discussion. Just, and this is knowing some of your research, but, um, do you think that the people that did not see themselves in the role of policy possibly maybe even did fewer things in terms of actions that of change? Or in the people that saw themselves more in this policy world, maybe did more things at the school. It's interesting. There, there had to be a mindset shift. Right. So people had to buy in. And what was what one of the curriculum specialist stories she told was quite telling. The individuals that came with an open mind and the people section that came with an open mind and the curriculum conversations that we had were the ones that we saw the most change. And the example she used was through the fake robotics competitions, so like school level competition, the competition. Where is she right here? Sorry. Um, that curriculum specialist. Oh, yeah. She's yeah. Both, both so both of them, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, okay. and, and so, and, and she said the teams that were winning these competitions, this is not, this is like programming and, and using uh, curriculum skill sets to, to learn in the classroom. The schools, 
that or winning these competitions were the predominantly low income and low income schools because they had that, that pre provided the capacity and the willingness to engage that mindset shift that they wanted to see that could be done. We saw book clubs created in, in these initiatives. And they were beating teams that had the highly funded PTA programs that had robotics for years on that, including magnet schools. Um, equity can work uh, if we give her an opportunity to do that. And, and if we had another graph that de that delineated a pathway, we might see that these, most of these five teams were coming from the schools that were in uh, the principal in the schools that were in those competitions. So I argue that we really need to look at the role teachers and teacher leaders as the policy makers, the policy actualizers, even when they do not see themselves in those roles. Because we can they brought about some meaningful change in this particular situation. In a given example, the school district has been rated, which it claims to be a highly rated district, but it hasn't been so for years. Um, but even this year they went from a C to a D because of some of the school the, the achievement gap less than that. Uh, it's still uh, bigger than what we might like to see, but it still has some uh, that it carries additional to the teacher. So again, the role of teachers and teacher leaders is quite important in, in that change. So what are some considerations? I think that we, we need to think about the methods that we use when we have these conversations. We need to be a little bit more non-traditional in, in our approaches. So to think about that, so there's one way to try to be non-traditional and see how many groups are engaging in this change over time. Uh, and, and so particularly in difficult issues such as the, the achievement gap, when we, you know, we of course measure that by self-assessment scores as we do the thing. But I think we have to be a little bit non-traditional in our methods. Uh, I think we also need to focus on the role of teachers, teacher leaders, uh, as these policy makers, the leaders that can bring about the changes that we would like to see. In this case, it's, it's an equity policy based in STEM, uh, but that can apply to a number of things. Uh, and finally, we, we have to stop with the post-war analysis. Uh, I, I would suggest that we know that there's an issue and there's some problems that we need to address and we need to do more attention so what are the answers? Uh, well, it was very heterogeneous. Uh, we, we touched on this earlier when we looked at the, the policy work map. Uh, but what it did suggest was that district policy making when it flows from the district to schools and back to the schools to the district, uh, we can see some meaningful changes. Uh, and the, the, the summit of assessment scores, I think, is one way to gauge that. But also, we need to look at how children are engaged in the learning process, keeping them interested, motivated, uh, and excited to, to go to some of these data points, particularly when we start to see that, that drop in the fifth and sixth grade. Really important. And I would also argue that more people were not, were actually actualizers in this process. They were using the language, even though they might not have perceived themselves as policy makers or policy uh, actualizers. And, and so we need to empower teachers to begin to think about that process. And by perhaps the, the change that we saw as a change that came from the Arizona might be able to bring about the conversation. Uh, and so what was some of the, where do I think we should go with this? I think that uh, we need to be more diligent in how we are studying epidemiological policies. How do we look at the outcomes, the actual outcomes that that matter to what we'd like to see? I think that we need to focus more on the role of curriculum specialists and district level individuals that we might not see as being able to actualize changes. We typically start with school boards and superintendents, but we can get some of those little known leaders at the district levels and particularly teachers. Uh, as is important. If 
professional development plays a role in this, meaningful professional development, professional development that, that is inclusive in everything. And I think we also need to examine new ways of providing leadership capacity. And just one well, doesn't necessarily need a role in the room as a variety of professional And where do we go next? We, we talk about equity or liking or wanting to see equity shape uh, the opportunities students have, but we often forget students and their assets. So Telos provided an opportunity to give an idea of what uh, equity might look like uh, through a culturally relevant, responsive, pedagogical approach, and particularly around STEM robotics components to do with this initiative. We, we saw some meaningful changes of student identity, engagement, uh, participation, assignments, and math, uh, encouraging students to persist, uh, to remain engaged. And then we saw some, some development, some initial developments in the, the scores, the science scores. In science and math schools, and, and we saw some excitement from teachers, teachers that were willing and empowered to try new things uh, and bring about recoveries and process. So, the mindset shift and how teachers saw themselves as teacher leaders without having that, that particular expertise. I see Quentin smiling, he was part of some of that thinking, uh, <laughs> and providing some key to those teachers. And so, I think when we talk about having lasting impact. Discussions you have to start with changing mindsets. And in this case, we saw one school that created a book that created to push their teeth, their principals to provide opportunities so that they can have collective conversations about what exactly they meant by one to be equity and how they could begin to naturalize that. So teachers as policy visualizers in this process and making that change. So with that, thank you. things. First, there's something out of Kyle Beckham's research right now on teacher leadership in all students. I know it's at continuation in high schools, but it might be interesting to follow up on with him. And also when Hilda Borko and Janet Carlson have done a lot with teacher leadership. And I, while it's more around building capacity for instruction, I think the training might be interesting to, to compare to how you're thinking about them in relation to policy as policy actualizers. And then second, in the theoretical frameworks and like your bubbles you had and then the policy action. Um, it just made me think the question I would have is like, what's happening? Where's the frame of like the school community context? Like you talk, you kept talking about Florida. Florida is a certain reality around testing that doesn't happen in every state. And the policy context, I think actually does play a role in how policy actualizers come about. And that that might come about in different pathways in a different state. And so I think you might want to like just adjust for that or acknowledge that in some way, shape, or form. You kind of do that in your talk. But I, I just wonder. And then I think my my question is um, if there's uh, like I I think the chat the challenge is like I hear a lot of people talk about policy. And then from a teacher perspective, you think of yourself in the practice role, right? You don't think it's hard to make that connection. And so I'm wondering when you were interviewing these people, these different roles, you know, you know, how are they, are you asking them a question? Like, what do you, when I say policy, what do you think I mean? Or, and, you know, like when they when you show that side of like, are they implementing the policy or are they not? Um, I would agree with you along those like methodology. You're gonna need to unpack that. And and so what did people say when they were you know, what did they think you were talking about when you said policy? So that was a key part of that cognitive test. Yes. And one of the things they said is thank you for telling us what the policy was. <laughs> um, they kind of knew what was going on, but they didn't realize that the policy was something as simple as the way the life just exists in the classroom. 
And, and so having conversations or breaking down the language is a part of this documentation mm -hmm. process. Because they were engaging. And what the data suggests is that they were engaging with this policy right. and practice and process. They might not have had the vocabulary to break down the key components, different mm -hmm. components of that process, but they were engaging. So when the, the fine arts coordinators said implement it, mm -hmm. I thought, wow, there, there's something there because they are really thinking about how mm -hmm. things need to change to shift the way that those schools bring mm -hmm. about these types of changes. And I agree, uh, yeah, this, is a, this is just a case example. This right. is just a case example. Right. Um, but when we think about some of the largest states in the nation, Texas, mm -hmm. uh, Michigan, um, uh, even New York and Virginia, like these testing is important mm -hmm. in, in those those contexts. That's the currency of the land, and and so California might be different politically mm -hmm. in that process. So it's important to bring down uh, that conversation too. So thank you for thank you for that. Uh, was there another point? No, well, I just I made two comments around teacher leadership, or just like the conception of it. It, we see, we hear it a lot in terms of like instruction curriculum or developing practice, um, and not a lot in policy. I think it's actually something you're adding, but um, I might think about when we talk what we what do we know about teacher leadership, and it might come actually in your implications section, um, or like how do we interpret this? Yeah, I think that's a good that's a good point too, because usually when when they were when they thought, when some of them thought about teacher leaders, it was more professional development That's right. or the individual that gets to sit in on the front school or the leadership right. at the school. Um, but making these, these minute changes and having a common planning period with, with your fine arts teacher, right. that's a leadership thing. Right. And pushing for that, that that's yeah. leadership. Thing. So I think that's, a, that's important, an important application. So, first of all, Every time I see your research developed and framed in different ways, it's just really exciting as a place to learn and to work from. Um, I have a question that is like maybe at the, I think it's only central and it's only at the surface, but um, definitely informed by my own current thinking. Um, it's about what are the stakes or consequences of teachers' self perception in their role? as actualizers, as policy actualizers, um, because, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about it with children right now in mathematics, and like, what does it mean if I see what you're doing, and I'm like, oh my gosh, you're doing this, like, brilliant mathematical work, and you tell me that you're terrible at math, right? Like, so, uh, yeah, teachers are, are actualizing, right? They're putting things into practice, and they're making things happen that couldn't happen without them, and they're Describing themselves as not a part of it. So, yes, I'm glad that, that perception was reality. Yeah, like what is that? And, and I am glad that the data says that this was a reality. I did not see this. It's not Xavier saying this is uh, <laughs> what is happening. What they told me and what I saw is what is happening. And I think that there's a, a dichotomy there. That there's the perception that we are disempowered, we might not have the value or the capacity that we have. Brain, we need our willingness to and build that capacity. Uh, but the reality was that these individuals were making ways to provide this opportunity for their students, uh, creating the GoFundMe account so that you can change the curriculum in the classroom. That's not a perception, that's a reality. Uh, going, calling teachers in the districts or schools in the district that had no experience with them, that's a reality. Uh, repurposing the school space uh, so that students can, can go there during their lunchtime or even after school, even though this is a during school activity, that's a, that's a reality. And part of that, I think, goes to there seems to be this, this lineage or heritage of you have principals and district administrators that make the decisions that they're the leaders, and then you expect teachers to fall in line and, and do what they're told, and I think that that's not necessarily. Case. You have that kind of that light bulb conversation with teachers and folks are doing whatever goes on behind that door. Uh, it's what happens. Yeah, that's true, but I think that it's not uh, as malcontent as that might suggest. I think what we see that we need to do is try and find ways to do what's right by our students, particularly when I have to make those conversations. We have to be like about change. Thank you. 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 Thank you
And so we, we have to reframe, part of this reframing is introducing the power plant. Letting individuals know that your capacity goes up beyond 40% of the uh, valuation that you know, you're here and you have to add your two hours to this and most of it also goes beyond the professional building and the capacity that you can go to in that process. Not to say that they solve every position, but there's still some structural issues that need to occur, but they're having the conversations and doing some of those things. I'm doing some of those I'm thinking about a piece that you didn't talk much about, which is the role of the superintendent as a driver of this change. Right? Because he not only made a new policy, he put money behind that policy. And, and he bought exciting new stuff for the schools, right? Which then was motivating for the teacher perhaps to do something with it. It allowed things, it allowed things to happen that so couldn't have happened without that money and that stuff. And so the question, the question is, how much of the actualization came from the superintendent making the right moves to put stuff out there for people to do what he wanted them to do, versus the people taking it up and doing it? And I think there's a very interesting piece of, of how you make a policy happen by doing something more than just saying this is the policy. That, just, that I could see in your story. Yeah, thank you for that. That's interesting. So that's a separate presentation, and it's a separate presentation <laughs> because when we dig a little bit into what the, the curriculum specialist was saying, again, these two people especially signed up to say, you know, they wanted to be a contractor, they wanted a contract as a union. The way they framed it was he had a very good vision, he brought these connections and his money, and he said, go down. And so you had these teacher leaders doing the work. That was a key part of his idea, too. Oh. You have the teacher leaders. Well, well, it was a key part of his idea to say, I'm going to add this to the job description mm -hmm. and, and implement it. <laughs> and what, what's what important about that, that particular relationship is them rising to the leadership and, and, and that capacity building that they did spot. So when you have the teacher leader saying, all right, I I have to be place myself in a role to have difficult conversations with principals, school board, the superintendent, my direct report that the curriculum, uh, making sure that I am keeping those conversations engaged with the teachers, providing a direct line to teachers. Uh, I think that is a lot of his capacity uh, that these individuals they were key. They, they were key curriculum specialists. And so I can understand why the arts and the curriculum specialist was so focused on data because he had career ambitions too. He wanted to become a principal. So he had to get this right as a teacher, leader, or teacher with special assignment. And so what's interesting in this story is yes, it's important. The superintendent had the brain the vision, but it did not exist before he got there. He did not have these critical conversations, it did not happen uh, before he got there in that uh, frame of manner. But he, he also created and structured it in a way so that these teacher leaders in the district could rise to the occasion and then help the teachers on the ground rise to the occasion as well and then provide position of the principals. But some of the principals said, it was my job to back out of the way so that the curriculum specialists and the teachers could have their conversations so that the curriculum was going to be used. So what we see as an organizational change necessarily. Uh, and these individuals, um, not necessarily being the policy makers, but the policy actually with that vision, and without them, we, we, they would not have probably seen the results that they had. So it just brings up an interesting point in terms of the title. Because it's really, if, if the structure isn't in place, it's really easy for me as a curriculum specialist to fall back on curriculum specialist. But it's also a different mindset for me to start moving from being a curriculum specialist to really being a, a leader. And what that entails, because in some ways it's a it's another level of, of ways to be and, and ways to think about and ways to move. Because now I'm a lot more into the principal's office or whatever. And so I guess part of my question is um, how do you build capacity to move some of those curriculum specialists from that mindset of I'm a curriculum specialist and I'm not really a teacher leader to I'm a teacher leader, and this is the additional things that I do. Yeah, 
think is that it's important. And so part of hopefully the foundation's element of this research, when we talk about different specialists or cultures, we're really talking about individuals that are asked in a specific role. You go in and do this in the curriculum for schools, or teachers, and that, 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 that's it. That's the main thing. So we see curriculum coaches or, or specialists framed in a way that's not the most empowering. Uh, and in some institutions that 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 is the case, but in this particular example, what we see are individuals reframing that conversation, and and perhaps it may this is just an speculation. Perhaps it's because we had two different specialists that have come through that were new trained individuals, and we had an aspiration to bring them to different district leaders one day, and perhaps they they had shaped their some of their, their mindset, but. Part of that core and what they said was, we it's time for our district to engage in this work. We know this problem has persisted for too long, and we need to do something about it. And the superintendent is given that vision, gave them some flexibility, so we won't take this any longer. We have a school board that's going to be one of the individuals, curriculum specialists that we have a school board that wants to see this happen. The superintendent has provided this, this vision, and we're going to do as much as we can in the field to see this happen. Uh, when we talk about uh, the reason I think we have to focus a bit more on the policy actualization conversation is because when we have superintendents that are engaged in change processes that are different, they don't last long. The superintendent is every 18 months to make sure they out the rest of his years under his three year contract. They said he was looking at the same board members. It's interesting because he used the analogy of um, when he was voted in. And he used the analogy of the Passover, or, or I think the Jesus wise into Jerusalem, and everyone is like happy. Yeah. And he says, I, I will be wary. And it's very interesting that he said this because mm -hmm. he said the same people that will welcome you will be the same ones that can then 18 months later, the same board members told him, You are moving too fast, too quickly. You're not relying on our institutional capacity. And that does not work. That will not work in our district. That, 18 months later, the conversation ends, but we still have underneath that individuals that were still trying to engage in this process. The TIVO system that we ran was the transition of him being kicked out and, and the new leadership, perhaps the, the, some might say the old guard of the district that had been coming to power, but we still saw these teachers <laughs> that were rallying together and saying, we want to see that happen in our school. We want to build that capacity. And so there's an actualization process that needs to be attempted in this administration. Uh, so we can't put too much on the vision of the same people who are going to do it and we're going to serve them and try to make them change. All right, thank you. <laughs>